All right, we're back for round two. Uh, we're starting with Tormented Crown. Uh, Tormented Crown, two cost relic. Uh, after three turns with a cursed player took damage, transform Tormented Crown into Curse of Torment. Curse of Torment reads, the cursed player's units are reckless. Let's actually put that one up here. Yep, come on. Cursed player's units are reckless, and when a unit hits you or the cursed player, draw a card. So, decent little benefit. Um, definitely gives you a ton of cards if your opponent falls into the trap, and also makes it so that all of their stuff is reckless all the time. Um, I think this is pretty good. I don't know where to put it on the power scale. It could be like as good as like, you know, like an A minus type thing where it's just usable in like, it's gonna be like one of the defining deck archetypes over time. Uh, like three turns with a cursed player took damage is not too hard to fulfill for a deck that's probably playing like counter control type setup. Uh, and then the benefit of giving all of your opponent's units reckless and getting just a ton of cards uh, from both hitting your opponent with stuff and forcing your opponent to hit you with stuff is it's pretty significant card advantage for a two cost investment on turn two. Um, I would be surprised if this is not a really, really strong card. It is fairly hard to evaluate. Uh, like I certainly do not know for sure if a card like this is going to be insane in the meta because like the requirements that it has are really specific and require like a you have to have a very like you have to build a deck around it and then you have to test that deck pretty extensively and if the deck can reliably deal damage to your opponent and then reliably deal with the reckless units afterwards while also reliably drawing cards then like I would say all of those are very good bets because it just seems fairly likely that you can do all of those things with a two cost relic. And if you can do all of those things, then this card is an insane card advantage engine that disables your opponent's ability to block with units and play cards that like, you know, use use a lot of effects. Just like it generally makes it really, really difficult for your opponent. This is a rough relic. And I would say it's kind of bonkers strong. It's probably pretty spiky, like a Spike Johnny type thing where you actually get like a lot of benefit out of it. I'm gonna give it like a tentative A minus here, but like this is a card that could be broken. Um, and the could be broken aspect of it is sort of where I'm not, not, not perfectly sure. Uh, you know, maybe this is just a throne card. Maybe this is an expedition and a throne card. Uh, in either case, this is a wild card advantage engine. It has a lot of caveats on it, and it's possible that like the developers have were quite aware of how good it is and have like basically just added many of those caveats over time. Um, it's also possible that this is a card that just like you know was designed to be like a crazy powerful option and gives you like a ton of good benefits for playing it. So yeah, tormented crown decks. I think they'll be a thing. Uh, that's my that's my main thought is that this is a deck that defines an archetype that archetype is probably going to be good enough to be played in like expedition opens and maybe that deck is not going to be like the top deck in that setup but i wouldn't be surprised to see it there and so that probably gives me a point where i'd say you know this is a strong tournament card that has some really really good advantage uh, this is the one I can be the most wrong on, just because there's so many moving parts and like the decks just really have to work. But yeah, pinging people with the uh, stuff is definitely part of it. Uh, anything where you get like a lot of like different damage points and just manage to make damage happen, like you could do spell deck, you could do any number of different things, and when that happens, you just draw a bunch of cards. So yeah, I'd say it's it's reasonable. Jufi, Sprite Seer, Stealth. When you draw an additional card, she gets plus one, plus one. Intrigue two, transform four, four power cards in your deck into Dragon's Eyes. Uh, neither of those two base effects are all that strong, but on a three drop, um, this card's got a lot going on. Uh, yeah, I really like the design of this card a lot, especially because I love Dragon's Eyes, and I just love all of the things that make Dragon's Eyes. I will happily build a Curiox Jufi deck. It's gonna happen. She's 
she's delightful. Um, but yeah, this card grows in a pretty hilarious way whenever it's uh, not stealth, which is delightful. And when it's not stealth, it still actually gets that ability, which is rare for a stealth card. Um, the Intrigue ability really buffs up the power of your deck and also allows you to like play... I think that is a card that like actually has an interesting Intrigue cost, where playing it for the Intrigue like makes it so that you are faking a 5-drop because it's just not more powerful when you play it as a 5-drop. And yet, it is also a card that you want to play as a 5, even like blank sometimes, because those Dragon's Eyes are so fun, and they give Jufi so much if you actually manage to draw one. Uh, this card's super fun in limited formats, which is something we don't have to mention too many times for Legendaries, but boy, <laughs> what a delightful time. Um, in any case, the design is like A+, the power level is like a B, um, it might not be even that. Um, I think the card, I think the card's entry cost is enough to make it really interesting on modular, and that means it fits a little bit better in a lot of different types of decks. Uh, and like card draw combined with stealth means that you can probably build Jufi into a decently large monster that can at least block on board, which is you know not bad for a three cost investment. I think the five cost investment is actually harder than the three cost investment to merit because. Like, uh, how many times are you going to get Dragon's Eyes over the course of a game? Generally, with four, the answer is not that many. But, you know, like, Jufi is also a card where you're playing a stealth card. So, you know, if you're playing stealth decks in general, that this kind of like, yeah, it, I'm back and forth on it. I think, it's a, I think it's a card that definitely supports a lot of different stuff pretty well. And it just does everything pretty well. Um, and growing up into a big monster making all of your, even drawing one dragon's eye, uh, anything along those lines, it's really, really satisfying. Uh, I would say that like paying five for this is very, very risky. Paying three for this is a pretty solid investment. Um, and like paying five for this is something that you absolutely want to do if you don't have anything else to do, because boy, all those dragon's eyes, uh, that's a lot of value for a blue deck that wants to draw a lot of cards. I think this card could be really strong, but I don't know for certain, and I think it's understated and doesn't have enough immediate advantage to be guaranteed super strong. Mist Helm. Summon. Play a 4-3 Mist Osri with Flying Aegis and Reckless. Entomb, sacrifice that Mist Osri. So you gain 4 life, you play a pretty decent unit, and then if you lose the Relic Weapon, you have to sacrifice that unit. Um, this gets you a 4-3 Aegis blocker on turn 3. It also has flying. That's pretty aggressive. Um, I would say this is probably decent. Uh, it's hard to kill Mist Helm as early as turn three. Uh, if you have a deck that can kind of support it, then yeah, like this is a deck card that actually does like a decent amount of interesting aggro stuff. Uh, it's awkward and it's a weird card to try to defend because your Mist Osri is going to keep attacking in, but I would say that if this Mist Osri is attacking in once or twice, like the first time it attacks in, if you can defend the Mist Helm the second time, you're probably pretty happy. <sighs> yeah, there's, there's just a lot I like about this. I think like playing a like, stone on two to deal two damage to a unit and then playing mist helm on three to just wreck something is pretty good i think giving extra damage to the helm itself is pretty good i think there's like a lot of interesting ways that this card can be used to build really really fast tempo and the potential exists for like a relic aggro deck that can do some pretty wild stuff uh, one thing that comes to mind is just huru aggro um, there's a two one sentinel that you can play for two and then you play Mist Helm, and it's a 6-5, and you also have a 4-3 Mist Osri. That's wild. Um, so, yeah, I am tentatively going to give this a B. But, obviously the unit is killable in some ways that are pretty interesting. If Attachment Destruction is really, really prevalent early, this card gets a little weaker. Um, yeah, I think it's fairly strong. Really interesting card, to be sure. Davia, Azure Breaker. Ah, yeah. I got this card in the very first draft of uh, Revelations, and it's broken. Doesn't play the spell. Um, or at least it didn't play the spell. We... <laughs> there are 25 legendaries that we're reviewing, and four of them were broken on day one. Um, but 
that's okay. This card is a good value option. Uh, I would say it's just like sort of an A for strength. Um, it is just a card that like the this, the the deck archetype that wants this already exists, and it is super happy to play it. It's a seven cost. It gets the spell back, which is great for you. That is like just like it's card selection and it's like the ability to return really really nasty stuff for your deck and it's an aegis 6 6 and it has a really relevant ability that wins the game for you if you don't have any other stuff in your hand um like this card just does everything at seven that you want a seven drop to do and it fits really well in spell deck archetypes so i think this card just basically deserves like this is like the flat definition of an a where it's not going to like break the game but it is just going to fit so well in like the decks that you want to build it in so yeah super super cool um and like does a lot of work Zumic Poison! Deadly! When it hits the enemy player, they lose half of their health rounded up. Uh, if you can do this twice in one round, that is a lot of damage to put on a four-cost card. That's my main thought on it. Um, I would normally put a card like this very, very low, because giving something a 0-0 weapon is usually not going to be very good or tempo efficient, and will often lead to very, very bad trades. But... Uh, you throw this on like an auto tread or you throw this on like something that can actually deal damage when it attacks uh, like uh, you put this on a Shadowlands Tyrant uh, anything that's attacking that actually can like just throw out a little bit of Yeti delightfulness is going to be really really happy with this uh, I would love this card in Throne where you've just got a 2-2 that actually snowballs your opponent every time you attack with it um, there's a lot of different ways that this card can just like make a lot of damage happen very very quickly and also it gives deadly to the unit, which tends to synergize really well with like storm collars and like anything that can deal a little bit of extra damage, like Lin Ray. Uh Lin Ray's listener? Uh oh yeah, I can't remember her exact name. But yeah, cards that deal small pings can now create large value. Uh, which is a great way to sort of continue to use this card's ability. The only thing it can't do is kill your opponent, but it does a pretty good job of uh, making a deck archetype happen. I'd still say it's only like a C plus or something. It's a card that is like, you have to build around it to get to what you're doing. And it's so unit and weapon focused that you have to invest Zumic Poison in a unit and not have that unit die to get your strategy to work. Um, but I mean, I think you can trigger this at least once without your opponent having a response window. So overall that seems pretty reasonable for to make somebody lose half their life is nice when you're just putting it on like a four drop and if you lose two cards for that that's not great but i think that overall this is a card that like uh, amazing johnny design does like a lot of really really cool stuff on that front um but like overall it's just like it's super hard to play the four influence on it in particular just makes it so you can't really build that stone scar deck that you want and play it effectively but like Lots of fun stuff that you can do with it if you can actually get it down on turn four. Gotta actually get the influence generated though. Gotta have the unit that actually does the double attacks. Gotta have a lot of things happen. But, oh, so exciting when you get it done. Ambitious Mandavia. Lifesteal, summon, kill an enemy unit, and Ambitious Mandavia gets negative strength, negative health, equal to that unit's strength and health. Oh, I think I originally thought that this gave plus strength and plus health equal to that unit's strength and health. Uh, as it stands, this is like an okay removal card. Kills a lot of small stuff. It costs five to play, which is not amazing. Uh, I do kind of wish that it gave the unit negative strength, negative health itself, because it, it, it's not very... It doesn't sound very good. Like, you can't really... Like, it's, it's kind of a pain to read, I would say. Uh, but... Uh, it would, like, at least allow that Mandavia to do something unique for a 5-drop removal spell, which is kill something permanently. Um, shadow cards do that a lot, so that would be something where I'd be a little bit happier about it. Um, but it, it kind of, like, makes it a little trickier. Um, in any case, this card kills everything, so I certainly can't say terrible things about it. Um, I do think that it interacts with you at its very worst, and plays, like, a 1-1 lifesteal on top of that. And that's like, you know, I might even be like B-plus material. That's something where you get just good value out of the card. You don't get an amazing unit out of the card, but you're killing an enemy unit unconditionally. So it's fine. Um, I mean, so what if it's a slow death strike? 
Uh, if the units you're killing is a 4-4, you get a 1-1 one, one lifesteal out of it, and that is a card that can stabilize you for a turn longer. Like, you get a little bit of extra out of it, and when you don't get a little bit of extra out of it, you're kind of sad, but you still kill the unit that you really needed to kill. So, yeah, I'd say this is pretty reasonable. It fits in most things, it's pretty strong, it doesn't, like, uh, break the game or anything, but it is nonetheless, like, fairly interesting. The one thing it is not is reusable. Uh, you cannot dark return this and then get, like, the benefit back uh, very much. Most of the time, if it kills itself, you aren't going to get that thing back because it's going to be a negative one, negative one, or something like that. Um, you can maybe use it twice with a dark return or something like that, so that's interesting. Dark returning a death strike is a pretty interesting concept. Uh, I am okay with that. Does the fact that it's a Mandrake makes it better is something that Bridger asks. And yes, I think that is very, very true. The fact that it is a Mandrake does, in fact, make it better. Uh, I would still put it in the B slot. But hey, Mandrake centered removal. Elding of the final hour. Stealth. When Elding goes to your void or hits the enemy player, if you have two shadow, you may sacrifice another unit or relic to play a random pale rider. Probably a card that gets milled or discarded more than it gets uh, removed, but it's really, really strong when it gets milled or discarded. Um, Pale Riders uh, are 4-4 four, four Deadly, 4-4 four, four Flying, 4-4 four, four Killer, and 4-4 four, four Lifesteal. So the randomness of the Pale Rider is a little bit of an issue, um, but if you are self-milling yourself with Elding in the final hour, I think I'm gonna have to give this card like an A or something like that. It's it's hard. Um, I don't think that the rider itself is incredibly powerful. I don't think that Elding is really good to play, but I think that that mill archetype is just so clearly a strong tournament archetype, and every one of those decks is going to be running four Eldings because it gives you four just cheap free blockers that you get off of just milling yourself and discarding cards. Um, so, yeah, this card just is going to be in a lot of decks. It's going to be in an insane amount of decks, and it's going to be providing a decent amount of power for uh, none of the reasons that are printed on its stat line. Um, being a still 6-3 is nice, too. It's, it's certainly not going to be bad for you. This card will trade up, but, like, yeah, the main thing is that this card is just, like, really, really abusable by mill decks, and mill decks have always been an incredibly powerful and spiky archetype for since magic's existence, I guess. <laughs> Um, so older since since before eternal um and mill is supported now in this format there's a relic that mills you for two and elding of the final hour and that relic that mills you for two i think that's a tournament archetype i'm gonna guess that that is actually gonna get there uh yeah she's gonna do a lot is it she yeah yeah, yeah probably so excellent excellent um so yeah elding's great uh uh, very counter to all of the things that I like about certain types of design, but nonetheless a card that I think supports uh, particular players in a way that those players need to be supported. So, um, and I think it does it in a way that isn't like really unpleasant. So, yeah, I'm fine with the design of this card overall. It's just not my cup of tea. Fall to ruin. Gorgeous, gorgeous card. Gorgeous, gorgeous promo. Uh, six cost, kill all units. If you have 12 or more units in your void, kill all enemy units instead. Whew, does that just automatically get an A? It's like a shadow, it's a shadow harsh rule. So like, it, there's no way it's not getting played in Throne because shadow just doesn't have a harsh rule. And like, paying six to kill all of your, your opponent's units is good. Um, yeah, uh, also this works in the mill deck, which uh, as I've already mentioned, is going to be a really strong archetype. Uh, so that seems really nice. Uh, yeah, I think like this card in combination with Elding is kind of crazy. Uh, yeah, this card is an A. It, it could even be like an A+. Plus. Like you, you could just see this card in every deck and it could make everyone's lives miserable forever. Uh, I mean, it's, it's actually wonderful. I don't think it would... Uh, I, Wrath effects are necessary and powerful cards that are actually really, really fun to play. Um, and usually pretty fun to play against because building out your board after a wrath is like, you know, a big come from behind experience. Um, I don't think that 12 or more units thing gets fulfilled as often as you would like, even in a mill deck. So I don't think it's like 
significantly overpowered to the point of being broken, but I think this card is nonetheless in every single one of those decks that runs a massive amount of mill. So yeah, it's super powerful. I'd give it an A. Mal Malaga Amphitheater. Sites are always the hardest to judge. Three cost, two health. When one of your or more of your units hits the enemy player, replenish power equal to Malaga Amphitheater's health. Uh, does not give you power extra, which is the saddest Praxis thing? I can't think of a sadder Praxis thing than not getting power over for hitting the enemy player. Um, yeah, uh, Diogo's agenda is mind fire slow and daring maneuver, all of which allow you to hit the enemy player to get that power back. So uh, I think you play this card on three, you get two power back and you play another unit, so it's a good aggro site. Um, like, you're almost certainly going to be able to destroy at least one card's worth of strategy. Like, the slow gives you information on the opponent's hand. Uh, it fits well with Praxis Aggro overall. It's a site, which sites never fit that well with aggro, but, I mean, it's a site where you play the site and then you get to play another unit as a result of that. So that's pretty nice. I wish there was a way to boost its health up a little bit, uh, but there's not going to be one in Praxis. There's a Justice one that'll do it. Um, yeah, and I don't like the fact that it doesn't ramp, because that's the only thing that I wanted to do. Uh, Diogo is a 3-5 with a pay 8 ability, and getting Diogo off of this agenda, if you actually manage it, is amazing. Because if that happens, there's a good chance that you're just going to be able to pay 8 on the turn that Diogo comes out before your opponent can respond to it. Which, uh, yeah, that, that makes your deck uh, real ridiculous for a while. Because <laughs> all of your units have double damage and charge. Um, yeah. Uh, for those of you who don't know, just so we want to go down, uh, Mindfire, exhaust two enemy units, clears the board pretty well. Daring Maneuver, plus two, plus two, and Overwhelm, makes it so that you deal damage for sure. Slow, if your opponent is not playing units, you have a nice option here to just make sure that they don't play stuff next turn, which is cool, and also to get a lot of advanced information on their hand. And then Diogo himself, which uh, Diogo gets to do all of the cool things. Very, very good. Um, Loud guitar noises. Always delightful. Uh, yeah, I haven't played this card yet. It's not uh, on my like list of cards to play, but I think it's okay. Uh, I think i give it like a B-. minus. I just don't know that sites for aggro are going to be all that interesting. But I can't deny the fact that it might be really ridiculous. All right. Pisto, ever-churning. When the enemy player builds a sp when the enemy player plays a spell, deal three damage to them. At the end of your turn, if you have no cards in your hand, draw three cards. Um, I think this card's super solid. <sighs> Where would we put this? So it's a six cost six six. And when you play it, you probably draw three cards because this is the card that you play at the end of your Econo curve and it just gives you a six six and then refills your hand. Um, that's not too hard to do in Rakano. It's Rakano is not the easiest uh, thing to pull all of your units out and just make yourself completely hellbent, or uh, have no cards in hand. Rather, that's a uh, yeah. Like I think that you can do that pretty easily, and when you do that, Pisto is a c card that you play at the end of your main phase. You go into the end step, and then once that's done, like there's no response window. You just get to draw three cards and play a 6-6. Six, six. That is a really powerful effect in Rakano. Um, I don't know if that justifies an A, or a, like an A- minus or something like that. The card is just good on stat line. It The play spell ability is, represents a significant amount of damage. The main problem with it is that it is a 6-cost Rakano card, and being a 6-cost Rakano card has never gone well for most things. Like, basically, 6-cost Rakano cards have to have flying and also kill stuff it's it's so weird how how like strange these cards end up being these mid-range Rakano cards because Rakano is frequently just like a really aggressive format and like a lot of the best strategies often don't end up leading to you playing a six drop uh, but I mean this tops off a six drop curve really well and it tops off the six drop sentinel curve really well I think I have to give this like an a minus I just don't I don't see it not being amazing and like, it's just, the, the main risk of course is that if you're playing a hand that plays out a bunch of your power, uh, oftentimes you're discarding your power to auto-trade, you're discarding your power to 
other stuff or you're like just playing lots of units you never actually get up to six and then at that point pisto doesn't draw you cards and also doesn't like deal that extra bit of damage um and like maybe your turn six should just be deal six damage to the opponent's face and kill them uh but i think there's a deck this card belongs in i think there's quite a few decks this card belongs in and i I think I'm going to give it a little more credit than it might deserve because I think like draw three cards, play a six, six is just, that's a lot to put on a Ricano card. <laughs> draw three cards, play a six, six, and also your opponent probably has to take three damage to get rid of it. Yeah, that's, that's pretty ridiculous. I think this card is very strong. Uh, Entratius, Beckoning. Stealth, when Entratius hits the enemy player, you see three random other units with stealth and choose one to play. Five cost for five. This card's like a solid B+. It's super, super solid in just general stat line. It has a really, really good ability when it hits the enemy player, and like, yeah, I mean, it's so much fun to play Unlimited. <laughs> uh, eh, I mean, I might give it like a B, because it doesn't... Nah, I don't know. The stat line is just fine. Like, five cost five, five is just really, really solid for a stealth unit. Um... This is the stealth unit where your opponent probably tries to play something on it, and then they are sad because it does not die. <laughs> uh, it is the biggest 5-5, five five, and it also gets that discover ability, which is just very powerful and will frequently win you the game if Entratius is left alone, which in an Elysian deck is quite possible. You've got a lot of different ways to counter things out. There's one cost cards that counter non-fast spells. I think there's a, it might be a, it's a Huru card, I think, that counters spells and prevents people from playing spells. But like, yeah, if you can make this fairly evasive. You can probably get it to hit the enemy player pretty frequently. I think that deck's relatively powerful and just like overall good. I don't think it's like a guaranteed tournament deck, but I think it is a very powerful card that you're pretty happy to play and you'll see it a lot in ranked. Um, it's super fun to play at the very least. Uh, I just don't think that it ever like breaks the game in half or anything like that. So, um, nonetheless, super, super solid. Death's Doorstep. At the start of each player's turn, they must sacrifice a unit. If they can't sacrifice Death's Doorstep. Um, so when you play this, you guarantee that your opponent sacrifices a unit, and then you probably have to do one in exchange. Uh, the disadvantage, I guess, is that like if you play it and your opponent like sacrifices all of their units to devour or something like that, then you lose out on value. Paying five for your opponent must sacrifice is basically measure that effect because that's the worst case scenario and I think you're going to get that scenario a lot. Uh, pay five, your opponent must choose to sacrifice a unit and then like, you know, maybe the rest of the deck eats itself, but more likely you're not playing a lot of units or like the units you have are pretty viable and valuable. Uh, hard to place in overall power level. Uh, flavorful as heck, really interesting. Um... I think that the forced ability on it is tricky, and the forced sacrifice means that there's no like permanent upside. It is it is just a situation where your opponent can stop playing units and eventually the card will peter out. But not playing units is sometimes very hard to do. Uh, this card's probably a little too expensive to be very powerful. I think it's like a B minus maybe a C plus because it is just like when it gets advantage it's a pretty obnoxious card but it still gives your opponent a lot of choice and giving your opponent a lot of choice that that might just put it at C it's yeah I'd say like C C plus even because like giving your opponent a lot of choice is really really rough it does make you sacrifice your own things which uh like, I don't think that that's so much of a disadvantage. I think that you are probably playing a deck that is going to use that type of uh, effect to your advantage. Being able to sacrifice things for free is often really beneficial and can be something that you really want to do for many reasons, particularly in Shadow. Um, but, like, the fact that your opponent has some control over their destiny in this and the overall like final value of it is that maybe it gives you like two to three cards up over the course of three turns and it's a it's not a cursed relic which is notable that is that is one thing that i think is kind of important to note this card does not get blocked by face aegis so slight points in its favor there but i think c plus b minus is probably where i put it 
All right. And that leaves Sindar the Corrupt Corruptor. Deadly Valor and Stealth. When it hits the enemy player, play a Sindar's Mark on them. Another pretty hard card to evaluate. But, uh... Hmm. This is a very tricky one. You can just kill your opponent with this. And you can probably do it in a turn. But you probably have to keep Sindar out for one turn. Which, for a stealth unit... Uh, I would say probably not that hard. Uh, you can put the card down, your opponent just, like, might not decide to deal with it. Like, they might not think it's a very big stealth card. They might think it's that slug, which I think you're going to be playing this with that slug, because that's going to be a pretty important thing. And then, like, after that you just, like, ice bow, ice bow attack, or do something wild where, like, you just managed to get the card to attack multiple times. Uh, you just trigger the mark multiple times in a turn, and surprise them and kill them really quickly. I think that that is like a B plus. I'm pretty sure that that is not going to be like, this is the card that has like maybe the most potential to be completely broken, but I can't think of a card that does it at the moment. There's a lot of ways to trigger this card twice. There are not that many ways to trigger this card three times, and most of them would involve a decent amount of at least three colors. So, you know, you're probably going to trigger this card once on the first go, and then, like, after that, you'll find some way to get the extra damage across. Force it multiple times. Um, multiple Sindars is definitely going to be helpful. This card probably kills you. I think that it is really dangerous, and you should not treat it lightly. But I think that if people are treating it with the proper amount of respect, then it'll get there. It'll get there. Uh, and it'll get there pretty well. So, yeah. Uh, it's a high power level card. It is a card that has a lot of potential to just win games. It is not a card, I think, that has the support to win games just yet without enough work that other decks can deal with it. So, that's my, sort of my final line on that, is that this card could just be an A-plus territory, but I'm pretty sure that there isn't a deck that does that. So, uh, at the moment, it's more like a, a BB plus Really, really cool. Uh, pretty card, to be sure. Uh, oh, huh, notably a uh, masked awakened cultist type thing. I, I was... <laughs> Uh, I was seeing this art previously as like art for the Queen of Glass, but uh, I guess it is not art for the Queen of Glass. This is like a, just a Queen of Glass supporter. Uh, do love this cloak, incidentally. This is a really good piece of art um, with a really good premium effect, but like the invisibility cloak is actually really well done here. And uh, I think Sindar is kind of kind of rocking it as far as art goes. So yeah, pretty sweet stuff. All right, that is the 25 legendaries uh, in the new set. So hopefully you have an idea of what's interesting to craft. Uh, again, my recommendation is like, if you're playing, uh, as newer players, it's usually better to take the cards that are just like good on average, good stats, stuff like Hellfire, Valkyrie, Valiant Guardian, that kind of thing, and just build, you know, simple mid-range decks that support the, your current card pool, because the, the, those cards will do a lot for you and be pretty consistent. If you're a player who has a lot of dust to burn, uh, looking at stuff like building the Elbing deck, or building the uh, Sindar deck, or building like the really specific Johnny deck is something to invest your shift stone in that can be ridiculously powerful. I think Mill is definitely a super strong archetype right now. I think there are some potential blue archetypes based around all of the weird blue cards. Most of them have some pretty interesting options. Zumic Poison, like there's just like a lot of interesting choices to sort of make for interesting Jenny Johnny stuff that could be really, really cool. And, you know, but base your expectations on like sort of how powerful you think the cards are just overall and how often you think that they can perform that type of setup. Uh, there are a lot of really, really cool cards. Um, this is a really, really good set, I think, and it's got a lot of really, really fun stuff in it. So that's sort of my final word. Um, Thank you so much for watching. Uh, this has been our legendary review. And uh, yeah, I have been Pojo. So we'll be back. Uh, we're, we're still on the Monday, Wednesday, Friday schedule. Yeah, you can find me on Twitch at 7 p.m. PST. Uh, and if you want to, please throw us like a Prime support from your Amazon Prime or come sub to the YouTube or Patreon because both really support the stream a lot. 
Very much appreciate you all. Have a lovely evening, and thank you so much for watching.